Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week. Last week was full of watery creatures. Today, continuing our complete exploration of the monster manual, we go the total opposite and visit the realms of fire. So, what sort of creatures live on the elemental plane of fire? How do they do that? And what sort of ecology would creatures of living flame have anyway? Grab yourself a hot snack, settle back as we are about to get deeply nerdy as we talk about salamanders as well as other races of flame just in passing. The elemental plane of fire is largely unknown to mortal life forms because it is so difficult both to access and to understand. We don't know how hot it actually gets, where or even what the deepest purest state of it is other than it being one of the outlets of the plane of positive energy. What we can say is that past the point where the average low temperature is over 4000 degrees centigrade or 7232 degrees Fahrenheit, any material will be well beyond its melting point and for instance a human body exposed to temperatures in the heart of the plane of fire for more than seconds will be vaporized as in nothing left as temperatures over 10,000 degrees centigrade cause the matter to just sublimate, turn directly from solid to vapour and disperse like a cloud. At least the upside is that it will be painless, as the human body can't process the sort of heat as it's feeling. The nervous system is destroyed before the pain signals even register in the brain. Being plane shifted into the heart of elemental plane of fire is like the D&D way of saying a thing is just gone, see you later, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go directly to destroy it completely. However, there are, this is where the fire elementals live, in a zone of energy and intense brilliance. They are soaring through primal power with interactions and environments that are completely alien to us. It's like a fish trying to understand a forest fire. No. When most folks talk about the elemental plane of fire, it is the bordering regions they are referring to, where it meets the plane of earth, where it meets the plane of air and water. This is the sort of environment that any player character can visit with any hope of surviving the experience. There are some generally known regions. We can't really get a better guide to them than the Planescape setting source book called The Inner Plane, so thanks to a noble and personable Ifrit guide, we learn that those who travel the plains call it the crematorium. The locals don't, they find it kind of insulting. Because unless magically protected, nothing lasts there for a great deal of time. The whole place is in flux. Even the solid bits are actually drifting in molten lakes of lava, which in turn are drifting over great vortex updrafts of fire. Their freet describe some landmarks as the sea of scorching waves washes upon the shores of the lands of fire while the scalding skies rise above, filled with firestorms and rippling waves of pure, invisible heat. So there is an up and down direction on the plane of fire. Also, when an object from outside the plane burns here, there's no ash or soot, it just vaporizes away to nothing but energy. Even non-magical metals catch fire and burn, eventually, away to nothing. The only protection is magic. Magical items are preserved and enchanted. Beings can move around on the one substance that seems not to burn away to nothing, which is the volcanic stone that forms great islands and continents of obsidian or basalt and shattered, scattered, though excessively oh, extensive deserts of pumice floating in an endless sea of fire. Of course, this is like finding safety by perching on a log in a bonfire. And these islands of matter are inhabited the residents of the plane of fire are not inherently evil. Ifrit, salamanders and other fire elementals may tend to lean that way, but you can encounter neutral or good aligned individuals for sure, such as the Helians. But, that being said, they are not likely to rush to the aid of idiotic prime material travellers who turn up to the plane of fire without adequate protection. Even a good aligned Ifrit will just laugh and watch as a character shrieks and then chokes on a lung full of furnace hot air, then staggers and collapses, burning away completely in about four seconds. There's nothing they can do, so it's hilarious. A living construct like a Warforged can fare a little bit better as they don't need to breathe, but they still need protection from environmental conditions that are a lot like a constant heat metal spell, and the wood fibres of their body will catch fire immediately unless protected. The alchemical fluids in their circulatory system will also begin to boil right away, but they can at least last a bit longer and perhaps cast spells or activate items to save themselves before they go up in flames. 
The whole plane is an incredible light show. I mean, fireworks displays have got nothing on this spectacle. It's very bright and somewhat distorted thanks to waves of heat and the flickering flames, which reduces vision to a maximum of only 120 feet for non-native creatures. The landscape is often canted to a slight angle as a whole slab of stone is part of a shattered flow. It's like a huge glacier in many ways, with great twisting towers, spires and arcs of rock, huge vibrant crystals, boulders of all kinds of shapes and sizes, sand drifts of granite grit and diamond dust, trickling streams of liquid copper, fog clouds of vaporized lead providing endless dazzling shades of ever-shifting skies, great balls of light as bright as the sun constantly flaring and fading from all different directions and distances, confusing any prime material being sense of time or space, kicking through a sand dune of black sand that glows from within as a rain of sparks and liquid metal falls from a plume of thunderhead flame shot through with arcs of brilliant blue-white plasma, seeking shelter in a cos chaotic line of swirling obsidian spires that look like distorted and massive unicorn horns, also glowing with a deep red from within. This is the native environment of the salamanders. But there are other native creatures here which one really hears about, so let me share that info with you. First, in any examination of the ecologies of the planet fire, one quirk becomes quite obvious. They all follow strict hierarchies. There are quite a few varieties of black mineral flies which operate like a wasp or a beehive. All the insects seem to have castes and pecking orders. The glowing... The glowing hornets are very nasty and beetles move about like herds, divided up into specialist type and always a ruling elite that boss around the others. The natural native creatures don't seem to eat, rather they just inhale certain gases and flames, gathering certain minerals and prey upon each other. The biology makes little sense to a prime material plane person, though they will recognise the dangers of the large fire beetles that do not like being disturbed. There are little creatures called uh, wyveras, they are black lizards with eight legs that feed on fire snake eggs and many of the tiny rock insects. The natives can make a stew out of the wyveras, plus they can make many fine dishes out of the meat and organs of the carrion-eating, teleporting rodents called scapes. Though, of course, the meat cannot be cooked as they are totally immune to fire, dead or alive. So scapes are like the rodent version of their blink dogs. Uh, as well as flaming creatures that mimic the form of some creatures you might find in deserts and mountain ranges. Also, in the sea of burning waves and the blazing sea, you can encounter enormous blazing sharks, monstrous creatures like the blazelings, lava worms, fire bats, bestial fire elementals, and flame drakes moving around in packs, while red dragons lair in their own craters and caves. They are not top of the food chain on the plane of fire, but certainly enjoy the raw power soaking through the draconic flesh and bones which makes them even more dangerous. Firetails and Shala tend to avoid creatures while the thriving fire newts, swarming in large, fiercely territorial colonies, ride their bird-like strider beasts and challenge any foolish mortal that enters their solid land. Ifrit are concentrated in their cities and citadels dotted around the place, while the Aesir, those flame-haired elemental dwarves, dominate the mountains bordering the plain of elemental earth, endlessly mining the incredible mineral wealth, uh, powering great furnace factories with the wheels turned by rivers of liquid fire. They are incredible engineers and metalsmiths. The Afriti long ago uh, enslaved great numbers of them in order to force them to construct one of the great marvels of the multiverse, the Eternal City of Brass. Well, I say eternal with some fine print, such as if Imix, the Archimental Lord of Elemental Fire, ever gets free of his volcanic prison cell, he will probably bust up the whole plane in a primal fit of rage at all those who stood by while he was confined for ages, from his point of view, thanks to all his time travelling and involvement with the eternal wars of the multiverse. Yeah, he's always a constant threat. Currently, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Fire Archimental Zaman Rule is in charge of the plane of fire. And this is why it is in such an unprecedented era of relative peace and stability. You never know though. It could go off like a chain of nuclear bombs at any moment. No sense worrying about it though. Two factions you rarely encounter and hear about are the flame versions of the forces of law and chaos. The chaotic pyro four are a very evil bunch who fight constantly against the lawful and generally good Helians. The pyro fours think they're doing very well in this epic war, but they are not aware of the full extent of the Helians' true power, as the Helians long ago migrated populations to colonies on the many 
uh, prime material plane stars, yes, including the surface of the star around which Tyrell orbits. This is Dungeons and Dragons, of course the star is inhabited. Why else would anyone go to on adventures to the surface of the sun? Which brings us back to the salamanders. On the plane of fire, almost all of them are on in the service of the Efreet. When the Aesirs threw off the shackles of slavery and managed to defend themselves from the fury of the Efreeti, the fire genies instead turned their attention to the immediate problem of the slave labour shortage and instead enslaved all of the salamanders, who are also amazing metal workers since they are hot enough to melt, literally melt steel, sculpt and work with it with their bare hands. The salamanders also fled to the surface of many stars, including the star inside realm space. So they're up there on the surface of the star above Toril. And there are also a couple of populations on the world of Toril. One in the flame peaks of Cholt, uh, right near the incredibly ancient and powerful living prison of Dendar the Night Serpent. And deep below in the underdark region known as the Firelands. But let's take a closer look at the salamander and their life cycle. The information provided in the Monster Manual for 5th edition is quite different in the specifics of their ecology, which, granted, makes for a slightly wider range of possibilities in 5th edition. For instance, finding or acquiring salamander eggs, much more interesting plot-wise. But that is not what the much more detailed ecology of the salamander in Dragon Magazine describes. You can include both sets of lore because there is more than one species of salamander. They actually share this sort of trait with goblinoids. There are the much smaller and more primitive, though no less intelligent, flame brothers, which are around four feet long. Most people think they are juvenile versions of the noble salamanders. They aren't, but it might be they who lay the, the uh, and hatch from eggs. The true salamanders don't. They are asexual and reproduce by budding. They grow a lump that splits off as a fire snake, which look identical to the fire snakes hatched from the flame brother eggs, so it's naturally confusing which one is which, and it's understandable that people studying the ecologies of these creatures wouldn't understand what they're seeing, when all of the fire snakes look pretty much the same. Salamanders have a muscular, humanoid, and masculine-looking upper torso. Their lower body is like that of a large and powerful constrictor snake. This body form really makes sense when you see how fast they can move, move across the varied terrain of rock and viscous ma uh, magma. The intense heat that radiates from their body is fueled by this black, tar-like substance that oozes out from between the scales that cover their body. This also provides a cushion of flame that prevents rock, liquid rock from sticking to them. While the large segmented plates on their belly provide the friction they need to move around at around 30 feet per round. The true salamanders reproduce once every 10 years automatically. They have no control over it and it takes about a week, starting with a swelling at the tip of the tail that grows up the length of the body. This continues until the last day when they are basically immobilized. Then their skin splits open and then adult emerges with a new skin and there is also a fire snake juvenile. The fire snakes spend much of their time, as much of it as they possibly can, inside a source of flame. An easy task on the elemental plane of fire, where they cluster uh, together in swarms, soaking up energy. In about a year, under ideal nourishment conditions, they reach adult size. These nurseries, are uh, the fires which they swarm in, are called blazers, and the fire snakes actually die if taken away from a source of heat for an extended period of time. Their corpse looks a bit like charred wood. For this reason, the salamanders heavily protect their blazers and protect them at all times. They are a very martial culture, in large part because they have enslaved the been enslaved by the more powerful Efreeti for so long, it's all they know. They are a naturally aggressive and energetic species anyway, so they take their frustrations out on weaker species, particularly any of them that are flammable. Fire snakes reach the end of their juvenile stage and swell up over the course of a week at the end of that year, at the end of which they split open and either a flame brother or a true salamander emerges with a fresh skin. The flame brothers never grow a lot larger. The true salamanders do, though. They can grow into the huge-sized noble salamanders, which are at least 50 years old and no longer reproduce by budding. The transformation into a noble salamander also involves the swelling and splitting transformation. They are not only huge, but they also sport a pair of antlers that grow from their forehead. These somehow focus intense arcane power and are integral to their ability to cast spells, which is very much like the character Hellboy. If you manage to sever the horns, the noble salamander loses its spell-like casting powers. 
The, uh, the Also, the horns can be used to craft magical wands, which can handle spells found on the sorcery spell list, up to 4th level spells, as the nobles cast spells as though they are 8th level sorcerers. Mage armor, magic missile, and banishment are pretty typical spells in their arsenal. There are slight, they're slightly tougher than the true salamanders, about add 20 hit points, bump the challenge rating up to 6, and add another plus 1 to the combat dice rolls. True salamanders have an armor class of 15. They can wear breastplates or chain shirts in theory, but they are unlikely to do so unless ordered to, and those items will be heavily enchanted uniforms provided by the Efreet Masters. They have 12 D10 plus 24, or between 36 and 144, with an average of 90 hit points. Certainly give them the equivalent of military ranks and a range of hit point totals to reflect the larger size and toughness of these various ranks. They are highly effective melee fighters. When operating in groups, they are lethal, and here's why. First, the terrain they operate in typically provides a lot of obscurement and cover. They will pelt the area with grenades that release fire and smoke to cover their approach. Then dash into melee range with a powerful spear attack. This is plus 7 to hit and does 2d8 plus 4 damage. They almost always use both hands when striking with a spear in order to inflict maximum damage. They might throw the spear as they race into melee range if the target is provo- proving difficult to engage in melee. They will always attempt to strike with a tail and constrict their opponent. The tail attack is has a superior reach of 10 feet. It's not only um, it not only hits at plus seven for two d six plus four bludgeoning damage. It also inflicts two d six fire damage. Any creature that touches the salamander or hits it with a melee attack within five feet of it takes two d six fire damage. They automatically grapple any target they hit with their tail, which has an escape difficulty of uh, DC of fourteen. Until this grapple ends, the target is restrained. That means the salamander can automatically hit the target with its tail, and it might not be obvious, but they can also continue to make spear attacks against the restrained target or adjacent targets. Being restrained, uh, attack rolls against the constricted creature have advantage, and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. Now, combine that with a group of salamanders grappling their targets and moving together into a cluster Uh, adjacent to each other. I mean, most fights involve characters who are reasonably close together. The salamanders can then go stabity, stabity, stabity against their own and their compatriots' restrained targets until all the opponents are highly perforated and no doubt very flame-grilled. Combine that with a noble salamander hitting the group with an area effect confusion spell and you can TPK an unprepared party pretty easily. Throw in some magma methods casting heat metal and breathing 15-foot cones of fire it gets very nasty. Lone salamanders are not cowardly, but they are used to attacking in groups, and many creatures rightfully face uh, fear facing them in battle. Culturally, they also move around in groups of three or five, which uh, this seems to be their social unit, and their social structure um, is militant. Their social drive is not reproduction, it's not food, it's not shelter, it is fire. Salamanders almost worship the flames. They judge the, uh, a thing's worth by its relationship to fire. They highly prize gems as they, as they enhance the spectacle of fire with their reflections and refractions casting dazzling colours. They make use of metal which melts and hardens into useful shapes at the touch of fire and the rock splits and cracks at their touch but it endures the flames so they respect elemental rock and stone. Creatures from the material plane full of water and fats and covered in hair are pathetic and disgusting to salamanders. We are lower than dirt in their worldview. Their society consists of groups that form clusters who congregate around the metalworking forge, which is ruled by a noble salamander king. On the plane of fire, they may be uh, more more formalised military force, so squads and companies under commanders who answer to their freet or a red dragon lord. Outside of the plane of fire, you might think they would gravitate towards deserts or underground caverns, dry places, but they need fire to both feed their metabolism and to nurture their offspring, so they seek out volcanoes or transform forests into raging infernos in order to make themselves more at home, and of course, as they run out of flammable materials, they will move on nomadically. They see native objects and creatures as nothing more than fuel for their sacred flames. Those who put out fires in their presence are in for one hell of a fight, because this enrages them. It's like you're stomping on their delicious hamburgers and their baby's crib at the same time. Like many other races of the Plain of Fire, salamanders also consider slavery to be perfectly normal. 
the strong control the weak. It's all they know. So you might find them in the company of other creatures who are enslaved by the salamanders. A typical example is the mephits and also the azir. They also like to keep beasts and rasts as pets. I have an um, older ecology video on the rast in the Monster Ecologies and Strategies playlist. A fun species, for sure. I will leave you with the following thought. Picture a wizard getting grappled by a salamander, and one of them, curious, grabs the wizard's spell book. Woof! Up it goes, and the salamanders don't seem uh, very bothered by this, but they're startled by how much this upsets the wizard. How could this creature love paper so much? Truly a strange species. If you have a better understanding of the elemental plane of fire, then hit the like button. If you love pizza and flame-grilled hamburgers, then check out my Patreon. If you love cheese and Mountain Dew, check out my weekend live stream, where you can grill me for an hour and all kinds of hot D&D knowledge. If you want to cut through facial hair like a hot knife through butter, check out my affiliated link below for Patreon Blades. And as always, thanks for listening. I'll be back with more Dungeons & Dragons lore for you very soon.